on to tonight's talk, which is traditionally a introduction to the incoming chair. Um, possibly as a yeah um, question of how on earth did I get here? Um, um, and I said um, in, in the flyer, so um, yes, confessions of a failed, sorry, computational engineering, engineer. Um, that question of success in career is, is always an interesting one. What makes a successful engineer? Because um, it's not been obvious for me, first thing speaking. Um, say on the fly, um, questions like, how is it that a mediocre engineering student um, like myself, can end up as a visiting professor and the fellow of the institution and a dyslexic become a best-selling author and a, a notoriously forgetful person could actually organise tonight's meeting. Um, what does career actually mean? Um, and hopefully these are questions we will answer or, um, and if you work them out, do please let me know because I'm looking for some myself. But anyway, yes, career. What is a career? Um, Careers do have many meanings, um, and and certainly I think both of these meanings do apply to me. For example, both my father and grandfather were engineers, um, and it's also fair to say that my career path has been nonlinear. Um, but there are also, but there are diverse ways that you can be an engineer. There is no one way that a, 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 a career could last. Um, so I, I, I will be, as an example, looking at my career to date, but also because positive bias can be a bit dull, um, introduce a few of the interesting things that um, I've learned over, over the years, which, um, yes, might be of interest. So, childhood. Um, love making models, Lego, yeah, Lego buildings. Lego roofs, that sort of thing, quite a lot. Uh, love reading, though strangely terrible at writing and spelling. Love puzzles, terrible at maths. Um, always in the lower set for maths, apart from my O level or GCSE for you uh, youngsters. Um, loved reading about science and, 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 and so on, but usually did quite badly in science classes. Entering, the entering drawing class at school, great at those, though never understood what earth I was actually drawing because it was all mechanical engineering. Um, all my school reports seemed to say I was lazy. Um, but yeah, I did get quite a good set of A-levels. O-levels, they're not A-levels. They were difficult. Um, loved computer games. Um, and that's an example of the first computer that, that I got, got to play with back <laughs> in the day, ZX81, um, 1K of memory. Um, which is, well, you can't even get a text file <laughs> that should fit on, onto one of those machines now. Um, yes, if you want to program, you had to program directly in machine code, which is not easy. Um, yes, did O-level in computing, failed. Um, and also, most significantly to me anyway, terrible stammer. I still stammer, not as bad as I used to as a child, but yeah, um, going through school, a lot of struggles, especially with the speaking um, and so on. Yeah, and knowing I was different, but not really understanding why. Um, university, 1985. Uh, can you spot the weird one in there? Um, yeah, so a passion for buildings. Also, a desire to try and make the world a better place led me to do civil engineering. Um, went to Surrey University, nearly Bradford. Bradford was actually my, my second choice, um, but um, Surrey was a lot closer um, and so on. Um, got pretty good grades in the first year, mediocre grades in the second year. Final year was not good. Final year, I very, very nearly dro I dropped out. His only stubbornness which kept me there. In fact, I left university really hating engineering and decided I wanted to do something completely different. I just didn't know what. Um, and yeah, did fail structures. Also failed computing. Um, education has not been my strong point over, over the years. Um, but some of that was, yeah, 
That was confusion. So, start off. Um, one thing that really confused me as a, as a first year student doing beam theory, um, lecture put this diagram up on the up up on the on, on the on the screen of the blackboard in those days. Um, and I looked at that, thought, yeah, that will work. Um, that middle point will drop down. It'll go into tension and and hold itself there. I thought, no, this does not work. Um, it will fail. Um, but I, I, I thought we'd do that, but, but apparently this wasn't a correct answer. So I thought, I'm wrong. Um, it wasn't until years later that I started looking at nonlinear structures, and I remember this went, that was right. It, it, it's, um, I mean, yeah, the lecturer was wanting to teach us linear structures, and I immediately went to nonlinear, um, though I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. Um, now, if the lecturer had put a roller at one end, that would have been a different matter. Um, that would definitely fail. At least it would found an equilibrium once the, the, the two supports had collided. But but yeah. Um, interesting to note, universities like MIT, they do start with nonlinear structures in the first year. Um, and and for me, I thought that that that, that could have worked quite well. But um, the coursework did. No, um, it's linear or nothing. Um, similarly, beam theory. Um, how about you? First year, bending was a bit of a mystery. Shear, shear made sense somehow. Um, and then I, I masked them both, obviously. And then later on, thinking about shear, thinking shear force. If it's a force, it must have a direction. So what direction does the shear force go in? And so oh, we always look at the, um, the cross section to look at the shear force. Um, so the shear is vertical, but we also put the shear reinforcement vertical, which again, not really making sense. Then I realized shear is a lie. Shear doesn't exist. It is just tension and compression stresses at right angles to each other. Shear is a useful fiction that, 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 that we tell ourselves because it makes the design easy. Bending, likewise, doesn't really exist. It's a, it, but it, it helps us, um, which is fine. It's a model, not uh, all models are wrong. Some models are useful <laughs> and shear is a useful model. Um, hence the reason why. Uh, we can actually use vertical links to deal with shear, which is in actually which is essentially diagonal in well, the tension aspects of diagonal. Um, similarly, torsion. Um, torsion is, is just like this. Now, shear stress, same on both sides. Torsion, opposite on each side, which is the reason why we can use shear links to um, reinforce for, for torsion. Um, the other question is then, which I'll leave with you, why are the shear links always vertical when the tension is actually diagonal? Rhetorical question. Can't work it out. Ask me later. Um, sketching classes. Um, again, something I got terribly wrong. Um, I was told to, uh, yeah, we did sketching classes in the first year. With, um, and they want to do the other 1.2.3 point perspectives, which I've been doing in school for years. And I remember on the bridge, looking at this roadway, which we're supposed to sketch. I remember looking at it go, if you look straight down, the road's parallel. If you look in distance, it comes to a point. The lines must curve. And so I drew that. And I drew the road actually curving up to a point, but parallel at the base. And again, that was wrong because um, we hadn't heard about um, panorama for photographs in those days. But you couldn't even take panorama photographs in the 1980s. Um, it was too difficult. Um, so, yeah, um, it's coming later. Um, yeah, sometimes so I had to learn subsequently just because you see something differently to, doesn't necessarily mean, mean you're wrong. Also, it doesn't necessarily mean you're right either. Um, you just got to be open to the possibility that one of you might be wrong. And it's not necessarily you. Uh, so, so it was a sandwich course. So 
two years in university, one year in industry, back into the final year. My year out was with Anglian Water, uh, working in the water industry. Um, helped to introduce the first CAD system into Anglian Water. So back in 1987, uh, Payfect Dogs. I remember that. It, 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 AutoCAD came along and it vanished. But anyway, um, now in those days, we used mini computers and there was mini, mini computers were so called because they were small enough to fit under your desk. Um, like that one there. They were smaller than the mainframe, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, yes, how things have changed. Um, and also, I remember I uh, worked on various projects, various treatment works, um, also the South End Sewage Outfall, um, which um, um, chucking sewage into the sea was a standard practice for dealing with sewage in those days. How times have changed over the last 35 years. Um, yes, and the outfall has been extended and everybody was happy, apart from the South End oyster farmers, because they had all their oyster farms clustered around the end of the outfall because all the nutrient rich water was great for growing their crop. Uh, I've never eaten oyster since. <laughs> uh, yeah, and if you do eat oysters, make sure they're grown in very, very clean water. Um, anyway, yes. So, back to university, survived, graduated, got out, thought, what am I going to do now? So I did get a job on site with Tilby Construction. Um, okay, it's Tilby Douglas uh, logo. They changed names. So I couldn't find the old one. But anyway, work uh, for Tilbury Construction, as it happens, building uh, reinforced concrete buildings for the REF. Huge, thick, um, over, you know, a meter and a quarter thick concrete walls. Um, you know, talk about heat of hydration, take the shuttering off in the following morning, you could feel the heat radiating off the concrete. I mean, you could also see the aggregate falling out of the concrete, but that was a separate problem. Anyway, work on site in the summer, that was all right. Uh, then came winter time, and I really, I realised that I was destined to work in a nice warm office instead. Um, yes, site wasn't for me. And I joined... A small consultancy down in Ashstead, which is near Epsom in Surrey, uh, working on sort of things. Pulled a frame building quite a lot. Toys R Us in Reading, the one project that my children were impressed by. Um, yeah, pull of frames, reservoirs, concrete reservoirs, housing estates, that sort of thing. Now, in those days, as engineers, we had one computer in the office do the calculations. Um, and two CAD machines, plus lots and lots of drawing boards and and calc pa paper. Um, I wasn't I wasn't supposed to do the CAD, but I did. I actually I taught myself AutoCAD. I taught myself 3D modeling. I taught myself Lisp programming, um, which did then mean I ended up um, actually doing a, a 3D model of a complex uh, rebar connection, which um, we were. Um, we were asked to represent the contractor to prove that it couldn't be built and build a 3D model. Yeah, I mean, we had a column, east beam, a rafter, a tie beam, and a gutter, and then the architect wanted the rainbow hopper go straight through the middle. And to be honest, we couldn't even fit the rebar in, never mind the rainbow hopper as well. Um, yeah, um, 3D modeling was a bit more difficult in those days, but I managed it. Um, yeah, and um, I mean, one thing I learned like there is that yeah if something excites you pursue it um i mean I mean, initially the reward is just the joy of of, of of trying something new um um but as you say fortune favors the brave or opportunities favor the prepared um mcdowell's was not a good place to work um it was a recession the partners knew it and they squeezed us all hard but there was an advert in the back of the structural engineer looking for a graduate with CAD experience. So I moved into the petrochemical industry for five years, designing refineries, designing in heavy factories, that sort of thing. Maybe not an industry I'm going to now, but certainly at the time, 
it was quite fascinating. Heavy engineering, seriously heavyweight engineering, um, which is fascinating in its own right. So this is the Shelburne Garden Refinery, which I spent many years uh, working on, actually leading the CAD team on that, all 3D modeling back in the mid 90s. Um, interesting about this, this is quite a remote part of Norway. So everything had to be built about 200, 200 miles down the coast in modules weighing up to 500 tons. They will then be shipped up and then crane lifted into position. Um, site tolerances plus or minus two millimeters, because um, basically all the pipe work within the modules, they just have to be busted up and welded together. So very, very tight tolerances, um, considering everything's prefabricated and then ships there. We had to use the second biggest mobile crane in Europe to actually um, maneuver th th things into position. Um, so yeah, it was a interesting time. Um, now, also at that time, um, yeah, going to public, going to speaking. Now, that, that that image there, this is actually from the talk I gave back in 2018 um, at uh, the HQ, uh, which for a time was the iStrike YouTube channel's most watched video until somebody burnt down a cathedral in in uh, Paris and knocked me off the top spot. I mean, it's still the fifth most watched video. Um, so it's not bad for somebody who has for years struggled with speaking. And now, 20 years earlier, actually giving a presentation like that, or even this itself was not an option. I mean, not many people like public speaking. I was completely phobic about the idea. I didn't like talking in general, never mind in front of an audience. But personally speaking, I was fed up with this. I felt that I had something to share. And so I signed myself up for a public speaking course. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, taking my fears on head on, which was brave, maybe. They videoed us and then played the videos back, um, which was difficult, should we say. Um, I remember one of the things they, they, I remember they taught us on the training course was be aware of the body language of the audience. And I think the uh, the teacher rec recognised my body language, which was literally sliding underneath the table. Um, yeah, we stopped the, stopped the playback at that point. Um, but, personally speaking, uh, I thought, the real thing is never going to be as bad as that, because I don't have to watch myself. <laughs> I mean, you have to watch me, but uh, sorry about that. Uh, but, yes. Um, and, so yeah, I, I then thought, right, <laughs> I can do this. Um, I mean, even now, giving talks is not easy. Um, I might look calm now, but you should have seen me yesterday. Um, most of the stress now is in the preparation rather than the actual delivery. Delivery is fine now. Um, but yes, I still do still get quite stressed about speaking. Um, but but the main trick I learned was it, it's not about how I speak. It's about what I, what I say. I wanna, my focus is on the content. And if you have a problem with the stammer, you have a problem with the stammer. Uh, I ignore it. Uh, and that and for me, that, that that's helped. Um, yes. Um, I've learned to, to live with that. And strange enough, it's actually helped. I think ignoring it actually reduces the stammer. But apologies if it is distracting. Also that time, I went for chartership, um, 1996. Um, so I did the um, the interview, the professional review interview, and they said, you haven't done any design work for two years now. You've just been doing CAD drawings. Um, so I thought, okay, went back, six months of calculations, um, yeah, gave up the CAD, concept back on the design, the calculation size, a lot of intense preparation, self-teaching, classes in the regions, um, Surrey and also up in um, North East, because posted to um, North West, posted to Manchester for a while. Um, oops, go back. Yeah, and, and one thing that I learned then, I mean, this is the Design Council Double Diamond, Design Double Diamonds, which didn't come out until much later, but the, the principles, um, were definitely there. One of the things that I really learned at that stage was about scheme design. Um, looking back at the examiner's comments, so many times they said 
Mm. This candidate only submitted one answer. And of course, you're supposed to submit two. Um, and inspired by um, someone I knew at university, they did chemical engineering. And in their first year, they had their coursework over the year was to compile a book of every single possible chemical chemical reactions. Um, so I thought, OK, um, so for my preparation for the exam, um, create a list of every possible structure, every possible way of spanning a gap, every possible way of supporting a load at height. I never quite managed to get to the end of it, but one thing I did learn in that is there are so many different ways that you can build a structure. It's more than just a truss or a portal frame. Um, or, or the other one is, it's still a concrete, uh, and then go with that. There are many, many options. And, and if you've got options, you've got choices, and, and you can choose from them to choose the best design. Um, also, that time, um, I went to talk down in, in uh, London. Um, it was an Emma engineer. I think it might have been James Sutherland. I'm not sure. But anyway, one of the things he, he taught us um, was that scheme design stage, um, there are people who are really focused on the details. And, will, and will, any idea you give to them, they will tell you why it won't work. And he said for scheme stage, keep them out of the way. I mean, his words were, give them a light flesh wound. Um, hopefully metaphorical. Um, so the idea was and then you explore the scheme, you come up with a scheme, and then those people, you bring them back in, and they will test your, your, your scheme um, in detail. Now, personally speaking, I felt quite good at the scheme stage, terrible at the detail stage. I mean, Neil, you you yeah, you remember how bad I was. Um, yeah, detail checking, not my strong point. But similarly, there are, are colleagues who are really good at the detail checking, but you you don't want them to come up with ideas in the first place. Um, and there are some people um, who are good at everything, um, but 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 not everyone. So um, if you're good at good at something and bad at the other, try and focus on just that. But it, yeah. Um, but both parts are 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 crucial. Um, you can't have just one aspect of the design. You have to do them both. Um, but creativity um, and options. What I found was look obviously looking at works of engineers of the past, but also looking at nature. Nature has been designing structures for millions of years, possibly longer. Um, yeah, look at yeah. Look at natural structural forms. <coughs> learn, learn from them. Also, look at how nature designs. Um, so many of the optimization methods are inspired by nature, such as genetic algorithm, algorithms inspired by evolution. Particle swarms, that colonies inspired by how insects um, work together. Um, neural networks and deep learning are inspired by how brains work. There is a lot we can learn from from there. Now, um, at the end of my time with Floor, um, it was a company called CSE came to visit, do a little software demonstration. Um, there's this little unknown fabrication program called X Steel. Um, they were trying to get it, they were trying to sell it, it to us at Floor for use in, in design. And um, I told them how they needed to change it to make it more acceptable. To, um, to, 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 to to consulting engineers. And so I changed companies. Uh, they, they gave me a job. And so I was then um, taking this um, little program called XSteel and converting it into a program, what is now known as Tecla Structure, um, um, which you may have heard of. Um, yeah, now at that point, um, CSC was in partnership with Tecla, then they, party company and CSC we created a little program called 3D Plus um, which was AutoCAD based it wasn't quite as popular as we'd liked um, but these things happened also worked on the SimSteel projects um, so BIM the forerunners of, runners of the modern um, um, IFC classes which was um, quite an interesting exercise and that led me to do my first paper um, which was on BIM um, last century 1999 um 10 years after graduating so 
I've been working Petrochem, where we've been doing data transfer, working on the SimSteel projects, speaking with a lot of engineers, I realized most engineers didn't know anything about this. If they didn't understand it, they and I realized I had experienced things and knew things which they didn't. So oh, I wrote the paper. Um, also, um, but my, first paper, my, uh, my first paper, this was also, as I know, the first paper in the structure engineer to feature cartoons. Um, yes. In those days, it wasn't called BIM. Um, it was EDI, um, Electronic Data Interchange, or EDT, Electronic Data Transfer, then BIM, then Autodesk sort of corrupted the term BIM. So digital workflows. So these methods have been around for um, 25, 30 years. I think they're finally coming together, but things do take a long time in, in our industry. Um, now, unfortunately, CSE, uh, they were running short of money. They were a bit higher on fire. And I was made redundant. Um, 2000. Yes, I spent a year working here in Bradford, a small consultant called Blythe and Blythe, um, um, entirely designing Weatherspoon's pubs, um, which the design principle was usually take some lovely old listed building and then just demolish all the insides and, and turn it into a pub and stick the beer cellar, not in the cellar, but upstairs. The bit, cellars are always upstairs in the pub, um, which surprised me. Um, um, gravity feed and that sort of thing. Also, of course, most buildings don't have basements. Um, but yeah, um, also, of course, first week there, I was sent on site. So top left-hand corner, that is the Plimsoll line in red car. Um, and I arrived on site and the contractor had taken these two old houses, knocked them into one, and to my surprise, removed all the ground floor low bearing masonry. So the entire upper floor was supported on acro props. Um, and I thought, my hard hat won't help me very much here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was quite unnerving. And plus the fact, um, See, oh, inspection. So there was, um, so you might just about see there's a step in the roof. That was where the party wall was. And some of that party wall um, remains and the, and the pearls and everything were actually supported. Not, well, it was steel work. It was steel work. It was actually an old railway um, track rail, <laughs> which they're using as structural steel up there, which was had to be replaced. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting times. Um, also, our fees um, for a whole de structural design were 10% of the cost of a bar. Just the manufacture of the bar cost 10 times what we were paid as structural engineers. Yeah, um, yeah. The client. Now, at this time, um, yeah, I actually wrote, I mean, you might know I wrote, wrote book, Computational Engineering. I wrote my first draft back, 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 in, back in 2000 on a little handheld computer. Um, problem with handheld computers in those days or mobile, mobile technology is they didn't have rechargeable batteries and the batteries went flat, couldn't unload, uh, download the, the data and I lost the entire first draft. <sighs> Never mind. Um, yeah, I put the idea of writing to a side for the time being. Um, but I also went back to, back to university, um, part time, open university, studying computing, um, Santa Fe Institute, studying complexity, um, st um science, also future learn, um, doing cosmology, history, politics, music, anything which means to me. I sort of threw myself back into education straight up. The, the Open University Computing Diploma, I actually managed to double my marks from the civil engineering degree, um, which I found interesting. Um, yes, different ways of teaching, different ways of learning. Um, also found the um, complexity studies quite interesting. Um, there was a lot of chaos and that sort of thing in the technical sense and uh, randomness. Um, and how useful randomness can be in, in design. Um, now, 
Normally, when we're doing calculations, we wouldn't do nice linear calculations. You can just work out the answer directly. But there are times when we're optimizing where we can't calculate the answer directly. We have to search for it. And ironically, randomness or stochastic methods, you want to be academic, um, actually helps us to find problems which we can't just directly calculate. We have to search for the answers. Also, as an aside, uh, randomness is not always as random as you think. Um, for example, did you know that the playlists on Spotify and, and so on are not, um, they actually make them seem more random by reducing the randomness. Um, our, our brains are very, very good at spotting patterns. And what happens with a, pu a, tr a true random list, uh, pure, pure randomness, it will, because music, put two tracks by the same artist together every so often, or two tracks from the same album. And people complained that this wasn't very random. So they actually reduce the randomness by every time that that comes up on the playlist, the algorithms just take it off and they reduce the randomness to make it seem more random. But yeah, patterns do happen. Um, also to note, yeah, um, the aftermath of the redundancy was a very difficult time. Uh, I mean, I, I know, Mental health is not often talked about, it, but we do need to talk about it much more. I mean, I had suffered from depression many times um, um, in my life. This this was the worst. Um, yeah. Um, I survived, obviously. Um, but it, 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 it was close. Um, but it did last all my time at Blythe & Blythe, and admittedly a little bit into the time at Arab as well, but it was, I was recovering it by that point. Um, so it is important to note that people don't like to talk about it, but, but many of us will suffer depression at some point in our lives. Um, you're not alone. Um, yeah, even though, even though it, it, it might f feel like it. So if, if that does happen to you, do please get help. Allow yourself to be helped. It's not easy to seek help at that time, um, but it is it is essential. But anyway, I moved to Arab. Um, 2001. It was a goal that I've been looking forward to for quite a long time. If you remember, <laughs> Neil and I worked on this project for, for many years. This is the... Um, I still think it's the Doncaster Interchange, but it's officially called the French Gate Centre uh, now. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we worked on many projects. This was probably the biggest one I worked on in those um, three years working in, in building engineering. Uh, doing the new build, doing the refurbishment of the old um, um, shopping centre, time to together. Um, making sure this building fitted in between the dual carriageway and the railway line and the bridge and the station. And yeah, interesting times. Um, but what I did learn that project, Nuggets, um, leading projects wasn't for me. Um, yes, leading projects is a skill um, which not everybody has. And um, yes, little risk was recognized. And um, so he points out there's, there was an opening going in Arab Software Group, Oasis. Um, so I had an internal transfer, which was perfect. Um, ironically speaking, I actually transferred not into engineering, but into sales and marketing, or into sales. I became a salesman or a business development manager, as we like to call them these days, uh, because nobody likes like salespeople. But I was went in as an engineer. And then I discovered that the marketing, the efforts were being done by the developers. Um, and yeah, they were quite terrible. Um, I took over marketing and they were doing support. Um, so I took over support as well and also took over the training. And then, you know, chasing invoices, that's a bit dull. So we got in salespeople, other people to 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 to, to, um, to look after all, all that for me, and I gradually sort of migrated from doing sales into where I'm now, um, leading leading a team of product experts, doing support training, um, pre-sales, uh, but also quality ma management. So focusing on the technical aspects of, of the software, which is um, 
much uh yeah well i do well at best but each of as an expert even our structural engineer has become an expert on structural geotechnical software cad docket management and and pedestrian modeling or transportation modeling um yeah it, it was fun um also got involved in social media so i've been on linkedin um since 2009 um yeah, been doing that a long time. And for those of you, I know social media anxiety affects quite a lot of people. If you do look at people's feeds online and go, they're all doing amazing things, their life's amazing, they're doing this, they're doing that. Just remember, they're only showing you the highlights. They're not showing you the times when it all goes horribly wrong. Um, or things didn't work out right. Um, yeah. Um, just remember, Social media is always filters. Um, it's, it's not the whole story. Also, that about programming a bit. Didn't do very much. I, I program a little bit, not very much. But um, I'm mean, sure um, many of you do dabble with programming. And there is a huge difference between programming the only little scripts on the project to solve one particular problem and creating a program which is going to be used by your colleagues for a start, or maybe colleagues in a different office. Or maybe somebody who's never met us or seen you before. Um, yeah, exponentially more complicated. But to get to that stage, you've got to go through 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 the the little scripts first, um, which is which is fine. Um, also, 2016, I had the privilege of becoming a visiting professor here at Bradford. Um, so um, full title uh, was the. Royal Academy of Engineering Visiting Professor in Structural Engineering Design and Computer Simulation, which was definitely too big to fit onto the door. Um, yeah, being, being a visiting professor, it's a lot of fun, or rather teaching and tutorials is a lot of fun. Uh, setting coursework and marking the coursework, that's not fun. <laughs> that is hard work. Um, I'm going to say trying to come up coursework, which would could some of it could be done by those at the bottom of the class, but also stretch those at the top of the class, and also is markable by me. Um, yes, um, having been used to open open design questions, um, do set an open question to students, you'll get open answers, and they're very difficult to answer. I, I don't know how you academics mark essays. Um, it's yeah. That, that was true. I, I didn't do too much of that. Um, but yeah, it was it was fun. It was a shame that the three years came to an end. Hopefully I'll be able to do it again so, uh, some some fun point. Also don't get involved with the various uh, panels. So I've um, been with the ISRAT Digital Workflows and Computational Design panel uh, for a number of years, um, helping, helping, helping the industry sort of look at computer methods and so on. Um, I was also invited to join CROSS as a visiting expert on finite kind of analysis um, after they realized they didn't understand computing because they're mostly, um, um, yes, so I was, I was brought in to help with, with computing problems. Um, also, um, yes, writing papers over the years, um, so 2008, footfall vibration, wonderful non-linear stuff, um, non-linear structures, um, 2014. Um, yes, tension structures are the most efficient structure you can have, except that they, if they fail, they will fail, they will, they will fail quickly, unfortunately. Compression structures, um, you know, tension structures where they will, they will adjust themselves to, to, to maintain equilibrium. Compression structures, might adjust themselves. They're more efficient, or not as efficient as tension, but because it's got way of buckling, but they're both more efficient than bending structures. Bending structures are the least efficient structure, but it's the one we always go to first. Because flaws, they are quite useful. Um, optimization. Um, this is actually based on my guest lecture I do at Leeds University, which is um which is still happening every year. So we basically sort of wrote it up and 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 published that. That also then um, became the seed for, for one, one of the chapters in the book. Um, engineer of the Future is a Centaur, uh, which is all about AI for engineering. Um, also 
they made into the book. Um, actually, it was, it was sort of the summary of one of the chapters in Men so This is actually came out the same year as the book. And the centaur metaphor, that, um, that actually came from Kasparov, the, um, the chess grandmaster, who was the first chess, gra master, chess grandmaster to be beaten by a computer, um, Big Blue. Now, subsequent to that, he actually did a lot of work with AI and chess, and 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 they used to run online competitions. Um, and the and the rest that AI always beat humans, but humans working with AI always beat both. And so the central metaphor, metaphor is that centaur is half human, half horse. So the best parts of human, the intelligence, the hands, and so on. Best part of the horse, they can run. Um, and they're nice and balanced. Um, and also, um, just in December last year, Accuracy and Precision um, in FE Analysis, written with, with, with some of my colleagues who have PhDs. And um, yeah, they're like, yeah, what is accuracy? What is, what is precision? What does that actually mean? How much can we actually achieve um, in a design? Um, which is actually a lot less than most people think, but never mind. On the question of the centaur, um, yeah, that, that, that stuffy image was actually an animated gift that I found online, which I found amusing. Um, I thought, where on earth did this come from? Um, I never did find out who created the gift itself, but the original images came from a book um, from 19, um, 1887 by Edward Moybridge. Um, and the book title there, we won't read that, but that is the an electrophotographic investigation of consecutive phrases of animal progressive movements. So basically, back in, back in the 1880s, people didn't really understand how animals move. The questions like when the, when, the, when, the, when the racehorse runs, do all its feet come off the ground at once or not? And and Moybridge was um, commissioned to actually work this out, um, and he did this by basically setting up whole series of cameras with trip wires. Now, bear in mind, this is, this is glass plate times. And photography in those days was a case of photographer taking the lens cap off and then put it back on again by hand. He worked out a way to do that mechanically using trip wires. So as the horse runs across, each camera will be tripped in, in, in time. And he th which then produced... So this is the original series of photographs um, which which somebody then took and turned into that centaur gif. And, and yes, Victorian times, that is a naked man riding a horse. You're welcome. <laughs> the book is online. It, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible read. Um, didn't just do horses, do all sorts of bad things. But anyway, um, yes. Anyway, computational engineering. Um, Four years of writing. Um, I mean, computational engineering, which hopefully many of you have seen already, um, this was essentially the book that I wanted to read. Um, I kept searching for it and nobody was writing it. Nobody had written it. So I realized I had to write it myself. Um, yeah, four years, evenings, weekends, holidays, um, threats of divorce. Luckily, in jest, um, yeah, it 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 was it was a big effort. I mean, it took me probably a year to mentally recover uh, 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 after it was published. They wanted to do webinars, but I was no, couldn't be done. But it has sold very well. Um, it is currently the second best selling technical guide in the institution, and the the best guide was written by that chap over there. Uh, <laughs> John and a few others, uh, the Conceptual Design Guide book, which I can highly recommend. And John, if you'd written that back in the 90s when I was doing my chartership, that would have been really useful. <laughs> um, some writing subsequently, um, I was invited to, to write a chapter on computational design for Springer for 4.0. It, it was the full, that, that was the same year, I wasn't quite ready, but I also knew that I didn't. Competition on was an area which I knew other people knew more about than I did, but I knew them. So um, collaborated with 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 a, a lot of people to write this chapter. Yeah, find, know the experts, bring in the experts, write together, 
and and that was then published. So Springer, uh, yeah, I might not work with them again. I wasn't impressed. But anyway, but I was also invited to uh, write the chapter for the next IC manual of structural design buildings um, by another member of the region. Um, edited by. Edited by. Yes. Um, Yorkshire and technical writing. There's something in the water around here. So, um, so I've, I've written a chapter on computational design and then FE analysis as well, because the other author was what well, due to that dropped out. Um, dates? Do we have a date yet for publishing, David? It is this year. Okay. Publishers work in years, not in months. But, uh, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> sometime, sometime later this year, that will come out. <laughs> um, yes, along with many. Uh, is it? Is it one book or? It's three now. Three now. It's not that as one book, and they've been to split into three. Yeah. In fact, um, I started to wanted to split mine into two, but the, the price was the same whether you had um, uh, for each book, regardless of the length. Because I said it's one book. And the, and I'm glad to say they did publish it as as one book, which is good. Um, yeah, and and if you want, some get asked about how you become a writer, and um, in the words of Neil Gaiman, who you may have heard of, a writer is someone who writes. That's it. Um, and yeah, it's a skill. Like all skills, it takes practice. Um, I mean, when I I didn't just leap, leap in and start writing a book. I, I was writing the papers before then. Before the papers, I was writing blog um, uh, papers, with blog articles, book reviews, and also doing a writing, which is never will never see the light of day um, for good reason. But um, it comes to practice. Also, yeah, artists. Artists have, have sketch pads. Writers <coughs> have notebooks. Um, so in my case, I did write a lot in the notebook and then realized I couldn't actually read my own writing. Um, so for me, computational engineering was actually written on this phone, uh, first draft. For me, I found a, a, a phone app uh, called Bear, which is really good for writing. Um, terrible for editing. Yeah, transfer it over to Word after that. But for the initial drafts, um, phone was great because you got it in your pocket all the time. Um, I, I found that very useful. So um, two thumbs, work, work pretty well. Um, also that picture, it was the book. Um, I did pose that. Um, you see on the right hand side, that is the handheld computer that I wrote the first draft of computational engineering on <laughs> before the batteries died. Um, other than that is, yes, the computer itself, the slide rule. Um, if, uh, there's not many people here who've probably seen them, but yeah, they are around. That was, that was my father's. Um, the calculator, the computer, um, the phone, the, the um, graphic statics, and and uh, and so on. There are many, many ways um, uh, we can design. Also, of course, um, the structural engineer has been a great support over the years, including for uh, <laughs> laptop stands. Ah, uh, yes. Also, if you're writing, it's also good to remember that um, good book or paper is not written. It is rewritten. Um, you do your first draft. You put it to one side. You go back and read it again. You go, oh, my goodness. Um, you change it. You edit it. You improve it. Actually, editing, is, editing your own writing is very difficult because tendency is to read what you meant to say, not what you actually wrote. Um, so getting something else to help you as well as well. I mean, editing computational engineering did take me eight months um, in total. Um, I find I repeat myself quite a lot. Um, yeah, the original book length, book, book length was 145,000 words, which I then edited down to 105,000. So it took off 30,000 words out of the book. And then and then realized I, I led enough gaps. So it then crept back up to 115,000. Um, Took a while, um, but it, yeah, yes. It's also good to know that, yeah, it is difficult to make something simple. And it's also, the better you are at something, the harder it becomes, uh, which is a paradox, which always surprises me. But yeah, I think because 
your own personal standards increase as your knowledge increases. Anyway, 2021. Uh, I've been suspecting it for a very long time, but I finally plucked up the courage and got myself assessed. So, yes, I am dyslexic. Um, everything fell into place. The stammer, the spelling, the handwriting, the difficulty in organising, problems in formal education, um, the constant feeling that I was stupid. Um, um, yeah, because other people seem to find things much easier than, easier than I did. Um, and as, no, some things I find difficult, other things I find easy, but I tend, naturally tend to focus on, 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 on the difficulties. Um, yeah. Now, yes, so I found something, yeah, the experience of being in a minority, um, there must be a misunderstood minority rather than an actively oppressed minority like, like so many of our colleagues, um, is, is, is interesting, but um, yeah. I would realize also, I am not alone. Um, it is estimated that it's between one in seven and one in five people are, 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 are dyslexic or have other, um, or otherwise neurodiverse, which means um, with people in the room and online, that means there's approximately 16.4 of you who are also uh, dyslexic. Um, I'm not sure who the point four is. Um, <laughs> But also, oh, that's the fact that's the question of, yes, how did I get here? On one respect, overall passion and trying to do what I'm good at and avoiding what I'm bad at, um, sometimes works. But also, but most importantly, especially today, teamwork. Um, yes, the committee, we work together to make sure things happen. Um, um, Different members of the organise different parts, which is great because um, not everyone can do everything. No one can do everything or be great at everything. Even heroes need companions uh, and so on. And of course, you know, famously, when Sir Isaac Newton said that he is seen further because he stands on the shoulders of giants, he was quoting somebody else when he said that. Um, that wasn't original even for him. Um, no work is done in a vacuum. Um, um, yes, my work has been built on the work of others, from other engineers, other disciplines, um, adding my own spin and insights and jokes occasionally. Um, people like Douglas Adams, great inspiration to me. Science, science fiction, computing, comedy, um, Rereading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when I was um, writing the book, there's a lot of serious wisdom in 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 Hitchhikers, which is sometimes hidden by by by, by the comedy. Terry Pratchett, fantasy, comedy, social justice, and footnotes. The footnotes in the book were definitely inspired by by Terry Pratchett. Also, then Jane points J. E. Gordon. Um, his book New Science of Strong Materials and Structures: Why You Don't Fall Through Through the Floor. They got me through my, my degree, um, and they also showed me that engineering textbooks can be interesting and readable, which was a complete revelation at the time. Um, that is still a problem with most engineering books, but um, yes. Um, and I think in terms of shoulders and whom I stand, J.E. Gordon's are, 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 are definitely, definitely the highest. Um, also, of course, yeah, committees get a bad rap, but... Um, Having diversity of folk is really essential. We have a range of folk, um, with different skills, different focuses, and some are organised, which I find a great comfort. And actually, this is this is a group of cis white males. Uh, we need something a bit more diverse. Uh, the temptation for all team leaders is to recruit teams who are who are the same as you. It's natural; they're easy to manage. Yeah, they, they make sense to you, but this is a mistake. Um, I mean, research is a study has shown that the more diverse a team is, the more successful it is. Um, a variety of skills, a variety of viewpoints, a variety of experiences, and so on means the design is considered. 
from more aspects and the overall becomes much more robust. Now, diversity and inclusion doesn't have to be just about gender, though we do still have a gender diversity problem, not as bad as it was, um, or ethnicity, sexuality, age, disability, neurodiversity. They, the more diversity and inclusion we have in our teams, the better your teams will be. I mean, after all, with structures, uh, we recognize that for robustness, we need alternative load paths. We need the same in our organizations as well. Um, and yeah, inclusivity comes success. And most importantly, it means I don't have to organize things. Um, I can contrast. Um, we're looking back on my career, but also looking back on the region. So this is a photograph of the Yorkshire Regions Committee and their annual dinner, 1930. Um, and I think um, we have definitely made progress as far as diversity and inclusion has gone, but there is still room to go. Um, so, you know, if you are interested in, in, in joining a committee and um, making a difference, um, helping the other members of, of the region and also getting CV points, always useful, um, do come and talk to me or indeed any other of the of the committee members. Now, a lot of my career has been about engineering and technology and how the two combine. I thought, how has technology changed since I went to university in 1985? So the pinnacle of technology at that time was the Cray 2 supercomputer. And what, how does that compare to an iPhone? In this case, an iPhone 12. Um, so, a Cray supercomputer, 1985, weighed two and a half tons. iPhone, 164 grams. So, it was 15,000 times heavier. Speed of the supercomputer, 1.9 gigaflops of floating point operations iPhone 11 teraflops. The, I, um, the, the supercomputer is 5,000 times slower than your phone. Um, cost, um, $1,000 for an iPhone, $32 million for a, for, for a Cray 2. Yeah, 32,000 times more expensive. But it's also important to remember that the iPhone was impossible in 1985. Um, I mean, for one thing, nobody had pockets big enough. And you would, and you'd have long enough power leads either for that matter. Um, and we had no internet. Um, there, yeah, uh, internet didn't exist until six years later, 1991. So to be fair, what we call the internet is actually the web and the web, the internet was around since the 60s, but it wasn't publicly available. But the, yeah, the, the internet as we know it today was, was first released in 1991. Um, and has radically changed everything we do, including in engineering. I mean, um, the as we can hear from the um, didn't come through. Where's me? Yeah, come on, sorry. Notes. Yes. Now, I remember back in 91 or 92, we hear about this thing called the Internet. What is the Internet? Now, these days you hear about something. What do you do? You Google it. Uh, you couldn't. You can't Google to learn about the Internet because, well, Google didn't exist. Um, I had to go out and buy a magazine because that's what you had to do to learn about, about things in those days. Um, yeah. Yeah. Things have changed quite a lot in that time. Um, so, likewise, looking forward. Um, 2060, okay, it's not exactly the same, yeah, um, 25 years, um, 35 years into the future. What will technology be, be like in 35 years' time? Uh, it will change. AI, it will definitely, definitely be significant. I mean, AI has only been, set, it's been 70 years in the making. It, it's about time it actually uh, makes a contribution. Quantum computing will probably be usable by then. Um, will we have quantum computers in our pockets at the moment? That's impossible. 
But in 35 years' time, who knows? And, and as it has been said, predictions are difficult, especially about, about the future. Um, I mean, what will be invented in the next 35 years to have as much impact on our lives as the internet and mobile technology? Who knows? But I, I'm looking forward to, 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 to finding out. And I'm looking forward to what, what, what the youngsters are, are going to be doing with it and, and as their careers um, grow and change over the years. Thank you very much.